Curious Kids is a co-production of WGCU and the Golisano Children's Museum of Naples. Support is provided by the Florida Gulf Coast University College of Education. Nothing curious. I'm gonna get curious now. Oh, curious. I'm gonna have curious now. Curious. Hi, I'm Cody. I'm Morgan. I'm Michael. I'm Jamie. I'm Jaden. And I'm Riley. Welcome to the Treehouse. We're really lucky to be living here in Southwest Florida because we have some of the most amazing beaches. They're not just fun to visit and hang around. They're also very important for habitats for a lot of other cool creatures. Like sea turtles and snowy plovers. And what about all those spectacular shells? Great place for a picnic, too. Lots to be curious about. Like the barrier islands? Check out what Jake and Jasmine did when they took a ferry out to the Kea Costa State Park. Did you ever imagine visiting a deserted island? Cayo Costa Island, once called La Costa Island, is home to Cayo Costa State Park. It isn't quite deserted, but riding out there on the Tropic Star Ferry, it sure felt like we were getting far, far away from the mainland. Ranger John was waiting for us on the dock, ready to take us on an adventure. You can bring your own bike or rent one there. There are lots of trails to explore. Then there's kayaking. There you go. Both of you paddle on the same side all the time. It took Riley and I a bit of time to get coordinated, but I think we got it in the end. It was easy for Jake. He was on his own. Hey, what's next? All right, you guys want to go see the rest of the island? Yeah. All right, let's go. Let's load up. How big is this island? Well, actually, it is nine miles long. It's a little over a mile wide at the widest point. There's probably 12 cabins, 30 reg regular campsites. Oh, what's this? It's a gopher tortoise. If you see them in the middle of the road and you want to stop and get them off the road so they don't get squished by a car, you want to pick them up and take them to the direction that they're going. And then if you pick them up, just pick them up right underneath the belly and they'll usually fold their legs and their head in. Here goes. <laughs> there you go. There he is. Pose for the camera. The gopher tortoise is a keystone species because it supports the ecosystem in which it lives. It does this by sharing its burrow with a variety of other species, such as burrowing owls, Florida mice, rabbits, and indigo snakes. What's this? Well, this, this here is what they call coral bean, and it's highly poisonous, but you can see the coral color, the red. So don't try this at home. Don't, don't, don't eat these by any means. If you guys like to walk some of the trails, this is a good one here. Just go ahead and walk down the trails. Just be careful with the wild boars. Wild boars. It was beautiful in there, but what was that? It turned out to be nothing, but it made us run fast. Wild boars do not usually harm people. So if you eat one, just stay quiet and let it pass. Do not feed them. At one time, this island was inhabited by fishermen. For the most part, all of the people that were in this area, in the Charlotte Harbor area, were all fishermen. Uh, commercial fishermen, mullet fishermen. Finally, we got to a beach where we could go swimming. Time for a swim! The water felt awesome. After cooling down, we went exploring. We kept finding strange holes dug in the sand, so of course we were curious. Ghost crabs live inside the holes. We didn't actually see one that day, but watch out for them next time you go to a beach and try not to step on their holes. Unless you want to stay on the island, it's good to remember the time of the last ferry home. We almost missed ours. I bet it would have been fun to be marooned. Maybe next time. Andrew McKenzie and I went to Sanibel Island to meet Education Ranger Becky Wolf from the J.N. Dane Darling National Wildlife Refuge. She had lots to tell us about sea turtles. The main sea turtle that we have here in Southwest Florida and on Sanibel beaches is the loggerhead sea turtle. And I have a replica of a loggerhead sea turtle. This is what they look like when they're starting to come ashore to make their nests. Now, why do you think they're called the loggerhead? Because loggers had to wear hard hats and it probably has a really hard head. Exactly, that's exactly why they get their name loggerhead. This loggerhead here, is my age, it's 30 years old. And here's when they're about a day old. So you guys can see the difference in size. So with saying that sea turtles, do they grow very big, very fast? Or do they grow kind of slow rate? Slow rate? Yeah, it's very slow rate. What happens is imagine 
it's pitch black, it's nighttime. All of a sudden, a big 250 pound animal, reptile, comes out of the ocean and she's crawling like an army crawl. So she's actually... Mama sea turtles crawl as far up the beach as they can to protect their eggs from the tide and probably from people too. In Southwest Florida, from May to October, hundreds of volunteers and wildlife experts comb the beaches at dawn, marking off nesting sites to protect them from being disturbed. She lays anywhere from 90 to 110 small ping pong ball size ball eggs that are a little squishy. So as the hatchlings are starting to move inside the nest, the sand that was packed up on the top starts to trickle down around them and it actually creates this sand elevator that brings the hatchling up to the top, about one to two inches to the top. Then they wait for the sand to go cold. Why? What does that tell them when the sand grows cold? Because that means it's nighttime. Exactly, that means it's nighttime and then they burst through the sand like a sea turtle hatchling volcano and they run straight for the beach straight to the ocean, but at the same time, predators are waiting for them. But before they even get to the water, there's another danger that can threaten these tiny creatures. Sometimes they get stuck in sandcastles and stuck in those, you know, those little moats you build around sandcastles, they get stuck. And then sunlight comes and it can either one, dry them out, or two, if they get stuck in that, they become easy prey for other beach animals. So if you're at the beach and see a sandcastle that has obviously been abandoned, then knock it down, level it out, so those little turtles can make it to the water. Sadly, that's not the only hurdle sea turtles face. Do you guys know what this stuff is? What is this? Food wrappers. Anything else that we're seeing in this bag? So this is what we actually are starting to find in sea turtle stomachs. These I also find beads from fishing lures. So I find all this stuff and these small little bits, sea turtles actually mistake for food. I found all of this trash out on Sanibel. Now what's really funny is this toy right here, when I was your age, this toy was a Happy Meal toy. So maybe when I was your age and I came out to the beach in Florida to visit, I could have dropped this. So that could have been me and I found this last year. So. We all accidentally leave stuff on the beach, but it's our responsibility to pick this stuff up. Despite all the odds against them, many baby sea turtles make it out into the ocean where they live on floating seaweed called sargassum until they grow bigger. Females always return to their birth beach to nest. Isn't that curious? No one really knows why. It's just one of the mysteries surrounding these hard-headed and fascinating animals. Yuck. Don't you hate finding trash on our beautiful beaches, especially cigarette butts? Trash on beaches can hurt people as well as animals. Did you know that turtles eat jellyfish? A plastic bag floating in the water kind of looks like a jellyfish to a turtle. And guess what? If the turtle eats the bag, it could die? Plastic bottles, tin cans, and fishing lines are some of the things we cleaned up off the beach. If you see it, take trash home and recycle it. Clean beaches rule! Tiny turtles make their way to the waters of the bay. Running fast as they can go, it's dangerous for those who slow. Swim, swim, swim out far and wide, walk beyond the pool of time. How I National Estuarine Reserve in Naples to learn about sharks, why they're important, and what kinds of sharks live in our Gulf waters. Biologists and volunteers here are working on a shark monitoring program. Let's go check it out. Fisheries biologist Patrick O'Donnell gets pretty excited about sharks. 
Not always the reaction people have when it comes to these important marine animals. So sharks actually come around here? Yep, they'll be here all year round. They start off as little babies, about two feet long, and then they'll grow to five, six foot before they leave the estuary and move offshore. What's the largest species of shark here in Southwest Florida? Uh, one of the ones that comes near shore would be a tiger shark. Um, you could get whale sharks near shore, but the tigers you could find right off the beaches. Those sharks are pretty big. Turns out the ones we were going to look at weren't quite that size. All right, so I've got a few species of sharks here that are found within this estuary. Do you guys know what this one is? A hammerhead shark, it looks to me. Yep, and there's actually four species of hammerheads. This is a scalloped hammerhead based on the shape of the front of the head. And I can tell this one's a male shark. It's got claspers here, and claspers are used when they reproduce. How are sharks important to our waters? Sharks are top predators in the system, and they keep the populations of other fish and invertebrate species healthy by taking out the weak and the injured uh, so that those populations are healthy and strong. Sharks act kind of like the turkey vultures of the ocean. Just like vultures, sharks eat dead animals, so they recycle organic matter and help keep the water clean. Pretty cool, huh? And one of the neat things about sharks is they have a sixth sense that we don't have. And if you look closely, you see these little pores all over the snout. And they're filled with gel and they can detect very small amounts of electricity given off by movement of the prey that they're after. Are these real? Uh, yes, they are real. They've been preserved in chemicals and I store them in alcohol for educational purposes and reference specimens for science. What kind of shark is this? Well, this one is not labeled, so I'm not sure. And you can see the teeth are in multiple rows, so that when the front teeth fall out when they're feeding, the ones behind it just roll forward and replace them. And the entire shark's skeleton is made out of cartilage, which makes them very flexible. There's actually no bone in the sharks, so the cartilage in the skeleton Okay, makes the sharks very flexible. So flexible, sharks can actually bite their own tail. Better not pull a shark by its tail. Much of Mr. Patrick's research looks at how freshwater impacts juvenile sharks in the estuary. Did you know that bull sharks can tolerate freshwater and sometimes swim up our rivers? How do we respect sharks when we're swimming in the water? Well, for our sake, we want to not swim when they're actively feeding, which is around sunset during the nighttime and during sunrise. So any time during the day is fine. Research shows that millions of sharks were caught last year, putting them in danger of extinction. Shark fin soup is really popular in Asia now. Can you imagine our oceans without sharks to clean them up? We can help by practicing catch and release when fishing. Learn more about sharks, estuaries, and other curious creatures by visiting the Rookery Bay Center. Did you know that horseshoe crabs are one of the oldest living fossils? Some of the curious kids met marine biologist Claire Crowley at Ponce de Leon Park in Punta Gorda to learn more. All kinds of different shorebirds live on or visit our beaches, traveling from as far away as the Arctic or South America. Fort Myers Beach Environmental Sciences educator Mr. Keith Lockenin helped Jasmine and Cody identify a few of them. Have you ever found one of these at the beach? It looks kind of prehistoric, doesn't it? Well, in a way it is. It's the molt of a horseshoe crab, and horseshoe crabs have been around for a long time. So horseshoe crabs, when they grow, they have to shed their hard exoskeleton. So what happens is this will open up right along here, and the animal crawls right out. And after that, they're really soft, so they absorb a bunch of water, just like a sponge. So once they absorb water, they grow very big, and then they pull um, calcium out of the water and that's how they harden their shells again. So the shell doesn't grow with them? That's right. The horseshoe crabs have to shed their shells in order to grow. Kind of like a snake will shed its skin. Found another one. Oh, excellent. Very cool. Horseshoe crabs look a lot like stingrays in their shape. They have that round head and then they have what looks like a stinger. But horseshoe crabs don't use their tail to sting. The only thing they use it for is to flip themselves back over once they get turned in the waves. Horseshoe crabs have an interesting connection to a little bird called the red knot. Red knots have one of the longest bird migrations in the world. They fly from the central Canadian Arctic all the way down to Brazil. 
the birds rely on eating horseshoe crab eggs to get them where they're going. And guess what? Florida's beaches are right on their flight path. Where are the eyes and how do they see? Horseshoe crabs actually have 10 different eyes. The two biggest eyes right here on each side are the compound eyes, and that's how they make images, although the images are a lot more blurry than what we would see with our eyes. And there are simple eyes up here behind the compound eyes and receptors on their tail as well that detect light. Is it true that they're like millions of years old? That's right. So horseshoe crabs have been around longer than the dinosaurs. Some of the fossils that we find are 400 to 500 million years old. It's a very long time. Why do horseshoe crabs have blue blood? Horseshoe crabs have blood that's a little different from ours. So we have iron in our blood, but horseshoe crabs have copper. And that copper gives them a blue color in their blood. Blue blood. Whoa, how weird is that? But the blood has some amazing qualities, like detecting bacteria. It clumps up around germs, so it's used in hospitals to help identify bacteria on surgical instruments. Should we let them go? I think that's a great idea. Horseshoe crabs belong to a group of invertebrates called arthropods, which includes crabs. But Miss Claire told us they're actually more closely related to scorpions and spiders. From April to August, Mr. Keith walks Fort Myers Beach scouting for nesting birds. Birds lay eggs all the time, so we're constantly playing catch up. So here we go, these birds are getting aggravated. These birds are really upset. You can see that forked tail that they have yeah. too? That really helps them maneuver in these winds. The birds, called least terns, are upset with us because we're getting too close to their nests. As you can see, it's pretty hard to see their eggs in the sand. No wonder they're so protective. They're not afraid of us or anything else for that matter. Least tern is actually the smallest of the tern species and they migrate to our beaches every year from the Caribbean and South America. And whereas most, most birds actually migrate to Florida during the winter, these guys are coming up during the summertime. The next bird we took a look at was the snowy plover. This time we really needed to use the telescope to see it. That bird is actually probably almost 100 yards in. Wow. So, that, wow. so that's why you know the tools I have for, for my trade are the binoculars mm -hmm. and the scope, because this way we can look at the bird without getting too close, and I can observe the bird and count their nests without actually disturbing their behavior. We think we have about 15 to 20 birds that live here year round. The snowy plover is one of the most endangered birds in Florida. Posted signs like this one help to inform people that they are nests close by. When the chicks are ready to hatch, they actually call to each other from inside the egg so that they can all hatch at the same time. Why? Because there's safety in numbers with birds. Lots of different shorebirds were on the beach that day and Mr. Keith knew most of them by name. Black cap, orange bill. It's about, it'll turn its head to the left. It's got this really long orange bill. It's oyster catcher. Believe it or not, what they do is they walk up to an oyster bar when those oysters are just open before the oyster can close, reach in there, snip the muscle because there's a muscle that holds it yeah. in there. And f once it snips the muscle, it can't close and it'll just suck it out. We can help to protect these birds by respecting the nest postings and getting to know them better. Mr. Keith helped us see their unique creatures with their fascinating lives, travels, and eating habits. One of my favorite things to make when I'm at the beach is this cool sandy hand mosaic. First, you make an imprint of your hand in the sand, then you put pretty shells in it, pour a plaster of Paris in it, leave it there to sit for a while, and presto, try it next time you're at the beach. It's fun. Dr. Jose Leal is the curator and director at Bailey Matthews Shell Museum on Sandoval Island. If you're curious about shells, this is definitely the place to visit. Some of them are just so colorful, like these scallop shells. They look unreal. Are these shells really their natural colors? Yes, all of them that you see here, that's the color they were originally. Why aren't there any blue scallops? That's a very good question. You don't see many blue shells or many parts of shells that are blue. And there is a reason for that, is that um, the blue pigment in animals is not a very stable pigment, meaning the color, the, the substance that makes the color blue doesn't last too long. Women living in the Caribbean islands created these sailor valentines using all kinds of different shells. They sold them to sailors who bought them as gifts for their loved ones. All those colors are completely natural. There's nothing there that was painted using, you know, color paints or anything, except for the central uh, ocean picture there and the little dolphin. It 
must have taken them a long time. We were curious to know what the biggest shell in the world is, and guess what? It's a clam, it's called a That's giant so clam, big. and there's only one side of it. There are two sides, we don't have the other one. You can see the scar here, which shows where the animal was attached to the shell, and that's the hinge of the animal. Giant clams live in the coral reefs of the South Pacific and the Indian Ocean. They are the largest living bivalve mollusk and the most endangered clam species in the world. So why do we hear the ocean in shells? That gentle sound you hear when you put a shell close to your ear is actually all the sound, the noise that's around you in the environment that's picked up by the shell. I wanted to know about the Junonia shell. That's the one everyone who visits this island wants to find. They're just not common here because they live in deeper water. When you have storms, the storms will bring the shell from, from the deep and throw them on the beach. What's the most common shell on Sanibel? It's called the transverse arc. And the transverse arc, um, it's like a little white clam. If you've ever been to the beach on Sanibel, you've probably seen the transverse arc. They're everywhere. One of my favorite shells is the alphabet cone. So many shells to look for, each one unique in its own way. Remember, if you find a shell on the beach that still has an animal living inside it, put it gently back in the water. There are plenty of empty shells you can take home. Beaches mean sand, right? But did you ever wonder what all that might look like under a microscope? We were curious. Then we learned about Dr. Gary Greenberg. He invents powerful microscopes, which he uses to photograph different things like sand. We wanted to know what made him curious, so we called him on Skype. Aloha from Maui, Hawaii. What makes sand different in different places? It's amazing to me that every sample of sand that I've looked at looks different. Even on Maui alone, every beach looks different because it's a reflection of the erosion from the hills and the mountains, which brings all of the mineral-like elements down into the beach. And then it's also the biological life that lives on the ocean. That biological life can leave things like teeth and bones, which break up into tiny grains of sand. But there are also teeny tiny animals called foraminifera, or forms for short. Each species makes itself a different house, tiny little shells called tests. Why is sand gold when you see it at the beach, but looks like a rainbow when you see it close up? The little grains of sand are smaller than the resolution of what we can see. So if you were to look at a painting made of a whole bunch of dots, little tiny dots of all different colors, and you held that painting really a long ways away so you couldn't see any of the dots, it would look kind of beige colored because all the colors would come together and blend into one color. So that's what happens with sand. Dr. Greenberg began inventing his microscopes 20 years ago to help him with his scientific research. We're sure glad he did because his photographs show us how every sandy beach has a beautiful world just waiting to be discovered. This photograph is of sand from our very own Sanibel Island. Amazing! Get up, get up, get active. The beach is a great place to play and get some exercise. You can toss a football, toss a frisbee, run around, and when you get hot, you can just jump in the water to cool off. Yeah, we had fun playing soccer too. I was pretty tired at the end of the day. Sophie, Alex, and Clint went to try another fun sport, water skiing. And some of us curious kids joined Miss Betsy for a beach cookout. Did you know there's a freshwater lake in Naples where anyone can learn to water ski? Even people with special needs. And it's only about $15 a class. It was a rainy day when we met Mr. Mike, the water ski instructor, at Sugden Regional Park in Naples. But we were going to get wet anyways, so we didn't mind. First thing we're going to do is we're going to do some dry land practice to get you ready for the water. You ready to go? We're going to head over here. Okay, line up on the boards. Guys, just stand up behind the boards, please. All right, guys, this is the dry land part of it. We're going to teach you how to kneeboard first, and we do it on land, so in case you're a little bit nervous or not know what to expect, I'm going to teach you to do it on land, then when you get to the water, it'll be a snap. Try not to even get your hair wet. Sound good? Yeah. My sister Abby and I have been taking water ski lessons with Mr. Mike since we were little. He really helps you feel confident in yourself. He likes to make everyone laugh and have fun too. This is the hardest part, but it's really important. Never, um, I want you to breathe in through your nose. I'm going to do it once, then you guys can do it. You're going to go, ah, like that, growl like a tiger. One, two, three. Ah. Oh, that was pretty lame. Okay, one more time. One, two, three. Ah. That's a good girl.
So the next thing we're going to do is take it to the water. And uh, ladies first, so we're going to take Abby to the water. The other two gentlemen will put you guys in the boat, and then you can watch how I teach, and you'll watch how she does it. That'll help you get it. Off we go. I have to admit, I was a little nervous. Put the handle on the hook. Hands on the side. Head up high. And smile. Ready? Here we go. Awesome. Okay, slowly crawl up to your knees. Take your time. Nice job. All the way up, all the way up. Okay, bring your hands together. Okay, big smile. Hold on, we got some bumps here. Hold on. Woo! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Abby made it look so easy. Next, it was my turn. Okay, I think I've got it. Here I go. No problem, it's gonna be great. <laughs> awesome job, Alex. Okay, now listen to me. I want you to put your elbows in a little farther, put your head down and your butt will come up and crawl up to your knees slowly. Come on up, take your time. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put our hands out to the side. Look, mom, no hands. Okay, and wiggle, wiggle. Awesome job, buddy. Awesome. It was time for Abby and I to put on real water skis. I was ready to go. I love skiing with my sister. I also love to watch her ski. She's really good. And finally, when it's time to come back to dry land, she knows just what to do. If it looks like fun to you, go check it out. There's nothing better than grilling foods out in the sun while having fun. Make your grilling treat a healthy eat by cooking up lean meats and veggies to add to your feast. Have you ever tried a portobello mushroom in place of a burger for a vegetarian substitute? Mmm, mmm, delish. There's lots of ways to create a healthy meal out in the grill, and being creative is all part of the fun. Today, we're cooking up lean turkey and veggie burgers on a whole wheat bun. Be sure to load your burgers at home with lettuce and tomato to give it a nutritious boost. My favorite dish is shish kebabs. These are fun because not only are they colorful, but they're fun to put together and take apart. You can load your skewer any way you wish. I like to load mine with mushrooms, peppers, corn, squash to give a colorful boost to my dish. So this summer, get your fill of healthy foods on the grill. Bon appetit. Barbecues on the beach rule. You guys had fun water skiing. I'm not sure I could do that. <laughs> I loved it. I want to go again. We're really lucky to live here. Remember to help protect those cute little snowy plovers. Yeah, and the least turns will let you know if you're getting too close. So many creatures rely on the beach. And the Gulf of Mexico. I think sharks are really cool. How about all that beautiful sand underneath our feet? I know. Weren't those sand photographs incredible? Take a closer look at all that sand next time you visit the beach. And remember, only leave your footprints behind. See you next time! Watch the birds, how do they fly? Look around, you feel the breeze. How come the air gets cleaned by trees?